The only way to clean up human environment is to get rich. Rich countries are clean. The, the human environment today is the best it's ever been in all of human history. That's amazing. On a scale of one to 10, mm. one being communist Russia under Stalin, and 10 being Ayn Rand's free market society, where do you place Donald Trump? Speaking of oil and land, the environment. Okay, this has been something which has been going around for some time now. Greta Thunberg, the environment's gonna die. And okay, okay, this is where I do, I am concerned, okay? Because I'm a big fan of wildlife. I, I, I want this uh, earth to prosper. You know, we talk about self-interest. Why do you want the earth to prosper exactly? So the, the air we breathe, the water that we drink. I so think, you want human beings to prosper? Yeah, and that is- or do, you want, or do you want the earth to prosper? You have to decide. Human beings, the, our existence is intrinsically tied. Maybe. But who do, you, who do you care about? Do you care about the Earth, the Earth, or do you care about human beings? Oh, both. Well, no, I want you to choose. See, I only care about one. I don't care about the Earth. I care about human beings. And to the extent that okay. human beings need the so, Earth, then I care about the Earth. Okay, so but yes. the primary is human beings. Primary is human beings. We them. have to take Great. care of our okay. own interests. So let's, we yeah. start with that. The primary is human beings. Mm. Right. So, so then we get on to pollution, whether it's in the water, whether it's in the air. How, if we're going to advocate for a free market society, how on Earth are we going to protect the environment to the extent that our lives are benefited. So you have to start with facts, right? Okay. The fact is. Global warming, do you believe in the global warming, climate change? Put aside global warming a second. Okay. The fact is that the human environment today is the best it's ever been in all of human history. That's amazing. You literally breathe the cleanest air you've ever breathed. It's cleaner than in the little village in Pakistan where they were burning wood and where the cooking stove inside the house was polluting the air that be, because of the fact that we're burning carbon fuels and we have electricity and we have all these things that make it possible for us to breathe unbelievably good air inside our homes. I have a little thing in my home that actually gives me the quality of the air in my home and it's pretty cool, mm. it's pretty amazing, right? You drink the, 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 the cleanest water we've ever drunk in all of human history. The water right was now. so bad that they, had beer, they, had, they were drinking beer because the water was exactly. so bad. Exactly, yeah. and, and the Thames River used to smell so badly. It used to stink, yeah. right? But Northern Europeans drink beer because the water was so bad. It, Chinese, why did they drink tea? Why did they invent tea? It forced them to boil the water. Amazing. To kill the bacteria. Amazing. So we, it's, we live longer, healthier, easier lives as human beings than ever in all of human history. Fewer people die today of weather events, than ever, weather, yeah. than ever in human history because of industrialization. All of this, the, the cleanliness we experience today is all a consequence of, 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 of industrialization. We have, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, Hoover's, um, you know, they clean our carpets. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But vacuum, yeah. Vacuum cleaners. Yeah. We have robots who do it. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the robots. Yeah, I've seen the, yeah, You don't even have to pull them. Right. It's cool, right. right? You can clean. You, we have amazing technologies, air conditioning, air filters. You can have filtering but systems. Within, like, for example, your <laughs> office, your house, whatever. Outside, go outside. The air is amazing. Well, as so, compared to London in the 19th century, when you had a okay. done so, so let's all go, over the so place. So let's go to India or like China or Bangladesh. Yes, Those poverty stinks. Quite literally. Poverty stinks in every aspect of it. And how do you become rich? By burning, the, by, by using the cheapest, most efficient form of energy, which today is carbon fuels. Maybe one day will be nuclear, but today is carbon fuels. In order to get rich so you can clean up the mess. The only way to clean our environment, the only way to clean human environment, if you care about little worms, if you care about spotted owls, I can't help you. But if you care about human okay. beings, the only way to clean up human environment is to get rich. Rich countries are clean, not because the environmentalist movement, but because rich people want to clean the environment. So they do things that make it clean, so including passing laws prohibiting polluting of those compounds that actually hurt our health. Oh, so, okay, so this is interesting you, that you mentioned that because the free market would say to the companies, you can basically, there's, there's no regulation. Of course, the protection of, of property rights and so forth. But when it comes to pollute, like if, if, if a company is releasing all these gases, yeah. 
So well, if the gases are clearly hurtful to your life that, and you can show it in a court of law, then you would sue the company. That costs a lot of money and that takes a long time. In the process, they could still be guzzling these gases and... Okay, but life expectancy is still like what you're, for your generation, well into your 80s, maybe mm. into your 90s. Well, you know, so, you know, you're losing one year. But, but the fact about, that there's industrialization has made it possible for you to live in your 80s. Remember, just 150 years ago, your life expectancy was under 40. So you're saying this whole global climate thing is number one virtue well, signaling. Let's wait, and wait for climate. We'll get to climate. Whatever you want to call it, climate change, global warming, because I know no, there's a slight difference. No, look, there are two different issues. There's pollution and there's climate change. I, climate oh, change okay, is separate. Okay. Pollution is if somebody's spewing out a chemical that hurts me, I sue them. I take it to court. We try it. If I can prove that what they've done is hurtful to me, then they get to pay a big fine. And then the government can pass a law, once it's proved, that says that chemical is bad for human life. We're excluding it. Now take climate change. Now let's make some big assumptions. Go for it. There really is climate change, and it's human cost. Mm. I consider those big assumptions because I'm not convinced uh, that it's human cost. Okay. Climate change is all the time. So the fact that this climate change is undis indisputable, the fact that it's human caused is, I think, still questionable. But let's assume it's true. The primary question everybody has to ask is, so what? So it gets hot, warmer. So, you know what, what, what the primary cost for Britain is? Well, You're going to have to invest in air conditioning yeah. because it's going to get hot. No, and well, and, I mean, and sure. by the way, you should have air conditioning anyway because it gets hot anyway sometimes in the summer. Yeah, but, okay. And it would be much more convenient for human life if you had air conditioning. So this will be an impetus to improve British life by buying air conditioning. Okay, so th that, I'm serious. Th that's, that's a massive op oversimplification. Tell me what the damage okay, so of Britain getting a little warmer is going to be. I personally don't mind hotter summers, but that's a very... What about warmer winters? Right now it's pretty cold outside. It I'd, is pretty cold. I'd enjoy warmer. I mean, I like to say Canada would become habitable. I don't know if you're joking. I, I, I'm not. I, I, don't know how, I don't understand how people live in Canada today. It's way too cold for true human existence. Okay. Think about all the, think about all the agricultural land that is underneath the ice sheet in Canada that comes, suddenly becomes usable for human. And, and it's true. Some people have to move out of the southwest in the United States because it's too damn hot and they can't live there. And they'll migrate to Canada. Why is that such a terrible thing? So weather has changed throughout human sure. history. So if I were to give you the analogy, so this, so this whole earth is a house and it's fine, the temperature of the house is slightly more habitable, but there'll be certain parts of the house that are, have, have been so damaged that they are beyond repair. Yeah, another reason I believe in open immigration, let those people move to the parts of the house that are more habitable. But then surely the house is getting smaller and smaller in terms of the habitable part. Yeah, there's no science behind that. That's complete BS. There's no science that says yeah. that we're going to boil this planet to such an extent that the whole planet is going to become inhabitable. That just is untrue. By the way, and if it is true, then to the extent that that is true, then people are investing a lot of money without government help in trying to solve the problem. You know, the primary problem, if there is a problem, to CO2 emission is nuclear, something the Greens reject, which to me tells you everything you need to do know about this problem. The only solution to the problem, the only viable solution to the problem, is something they reject, which means they don't want to solve the problem. They actually... So, so what what's they, the underlying game for them? What's the, what's the destruction. Of capitalism. Destruction. Of, the, 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 of capitalism and human life. Because that's what it means to destroy capitalism, means to destroy human life. The only reason they eight billion people on the planet right now and they can eat is because of capitalism. So it's With, like a side way to attack capitalism, not through the main way. Like absolutely, communism. but it's more than to attack capitalism, it's to attack human life. There are people in the world, it's hard to believe, but there are people in the world who hate for the sake of hatred, who like knocking down stuff, who like destruction, right? Who want to see death and destruction. And if you're such a person, then your primary tool right now is climate change. This is wow. this is a great way to, to, to destroy the capitalist system. And by the way, who are the biggest victims? Africa. Africa's gonna be the biggest victim of the anti climate change. Because Why is Af that? because Africa could get rich. What would it need to do? What would it need in order to get rich? Cheap energy. But you're taking away the cheap energy. Now you're saying you can't use fossil fuels. That means Africa stays poor. Because you can there's no way they can afford solar energy. There's no way they can afford wind energy. And the wind and solar energy... It's like a minimum wage on a... Yeah, it's a, but it's, a, it's yeah. like a minimum yeah. like setting in the minimum yeah. wage at a thousand bucks an hour. You may be basically keep keeping a lot of people poor. Okay. And that's what, that's what you're doing to Africa. Now, notice that people like Bill Gates, who believe in climate change, are pouring billions of their own dollars into developing new technologies. 
if the environmentalists really believed in climate change and really wanted to help human life, they would be supporting efforts by Bill Gates and other people mm. to promote nuclear. Instead, what is, what is, what is, take Germany, right? They're shutting down all their nuclear power plants. They're literally shutting down on the nuclear power plant and building windmills and, 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 and solar panels. Solar panels in, in Germany. I, I've never seen a sunny day in Germany. And then, and then what happens is suddenly their production of electricity has gone like this. They've, it's gone way down. So what do they do? They import natural gas and coal and they reignite old power, power plants and their CO2 emissions are going up because they shut down nuclear power. Now, I can understand a green who comes to me and says, look, I really believe this, and I want to invest heavily in nuclear power because that's the only viable solution. I respect somebody like that. And I say, you know, maybe I'm willing to consider what you have to say. But if you're coming to me and saying the only way to solve this problem is to get rid of fossil fuels, you're not serious. You don't really care. Right. You're not pro-human growth and human success in okay. human life. One very last quick question on the environment. You said the spotted owl tigers, lions, elephants, rhinos, these, yeah. these animals are suffering because human beings are expanding. Sure. So sure. I, I, I'm, I'm a realist in the sense I understand there's a cost sure. of human expansion sure. and human beings living. Sure. At the same time, you like lions. I and want tigers lions and tigers and rhinos sure. and owls sure, to survive. Buy some. I, can't, I can't afford it. I, I okay, so get together with a lot of people who like them and buy some. So the, the, the solution is private property. Like everything mm. else, the solution is private property. There's an organization in the United States, which I respect their work, right? What they do is they raise money and they go buy forests. They buy forests under the understanding that they will never use those forests. It's a nonprofit that wants to preserve forests the way they are. Fine. Private property. And you know what? Nobody cuts down their trees because it's private property and nobody's allowed to go there. You know what? You that's, that's a good, that's a very good... Uh... Look at Africa. The only place in Africa where, where, where uh, elephants are not endangered species or where elephants are being privatized. Uh, there, there are certain areas in Kenya where the elephant population is being privatized. You own this park of elephant, and you know how you make a living off the elephants? You sell, you sell um, hunters licenses, and you let the hunters shoot elephants. But you have a strong, self-interested, economic, capitalist, profit-seeking in, in interest not to let the elephants die out. So you only allow X amount of hunting, and you invest in security and protection to keep out poachers. Amazing. But that's and, what's got the most outrage in, in and, social media. And, and yet, that's the only thing reviving the population of elephants in Africa. Every place in Africa that has privatized their wildlife has actually seen an increase in that wildlife. And everywhere where the state is responsible for the wildlife Ridiculous. and banning poaching, the poachers get around it because the state won't invest enough resources. But if it's my elephants, then I'm gonna you're not it. shooting them. I'm going to have enough security around that you won't shoot them. If you want to shoot them, you have to pay me. Very and then I'm only going to let you shoot one because I have to preserve the species. So the solution to all these mm. animals going extinct is to privatize them because private property is the only consistent form of prop. It's the only form of property and it's the only thing consistent with human to, life and flourishing. To incentivize the protection and its flourish. Yeah. You know, I am an advocate for private property, not because it incentivizes the protection of elephants. Yeah, I'm, in, yeah, yeah. I'm in charge of private property because it's the only institution that is consistent with human life, that it's the only institution that's consistent with human flourishing and human survival. You, we as human beings need to own the stuff we produce. Okay. And when we do so, look at history, good things happen. Okay. And that is applicable to elephants as well. So, and lions and tigers. We'll play a little game here. On a scale of one to ten, mm. one being communist Russia under Stalin, and ten being Ayn Rand's free market society, where do you place Donald Trump? So ten is Ayn Rand, and one is Stalin. Donald Trump is such an enigma. Four. Four. So okay. C closer to communism to Ayn oh, Rand. Oh, interesting. Barack Obama. Four. I don't think I don't think there's that big of a difference. Clinton, Reagan. Reagan maybe five, everybody else four. So who was the closest to Ayn Rand and who was the closest to Stalin, American presidents? <sighs> closest to Ayn Rand would be, I don't know, Grover Cleveland, uh, maybe Coolidge, maybe Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington, the founding fathers, obviously. And closest um, to? Well, I mean, you'd, you'd have to have a long line of, of, of FDR, name, FDR, Johnson, uh, and, and, and Obama and, 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 uh, and Trump, they're the most statist. You say Trump also is in that category? Yeah, he's a complete statist. 
calls up CEOs and tells them where they can put their factories and where they can, who they should fire and who they shouldn't fire. I think I mean, that's he's a complete. Trump, yeah. He's yeah. a complete, uh, you know, central planner. And he believes in it. So he's deregulated a little bit. He's cut a little bit of taxes, but government spending is like, it's, it's back to Obama levels. So it's back to the first Obama administration. Second Obama administration spending actually declined as a percent of GDP. Now we're, we're through the roof percent of GDP. So no, in, in, in many respects, Trump is a, is a complete statist. I mean, the wall, I mean, all of that is, is I mean, who built the wall? The, 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 the Soviets did to keep their population in. Berlin Wall as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the same yeah. thing, right? People have a right to go where they want to go as, unless they're harming other people. The state has no role in interfering in human movement unless that movement is a violation of rights. And a Mexican coming to America is not a violation of rights, and an American going to Mexico is not a violation of rights. Okay. Building walls is, a, is, is, is disrupting that movement, and that's wrong. Two last questions from social media. I have a question for Yaron. Does objectivism have a marketing problem? If objectivism is so inspiring, why aren't more people aware of it or inspired by it? And that's by G.S. Singh. I don't think the problem is a marketing problem, although if you have a better marketing solution, I'm, I'm, I'm open to uh, alternative marketing uh, mechanisms. Because when you say words like selfish, yeah. Altruism is bad. Yeah. You shut the minds of people. Like they're like, okay, this is this must be evil. Young people who want to change the world, they're revolutionary. They want to love and care. If you say altruism is bad, be well, selfish. They're but, like, this is. But this love is. and care is not revolutionary. Love and care is like everybody. I, I agree. But, but I would say, I would say that if you want to be a revolution, come join the real revolutionaries. We're the only I, real revolutionaries. I that, that is true. But I, I would say that the left or communism, socialism has a better. better no, we don't have a marketing problem. What we have is 2,000 years of really, really, really bad philosophy and religion problem. So to overcome Christianity, Judaism, Islam, to overcome Marx, Hegel, Kant, Schopenhauer, every philosopher in human, you know, before that, uh, is gonna take a long time. And the reason people, you know, if you'd said selfish to a Greek in ancient Greece, they would have said, well, of course, what else is there? Because that was the culture. The culture was even Plato, who's very dictatorial. Mm. He does it because he believes in individual happiness, individual to pursue their self-interest. He, he just says, you know, you can't completely do that for yourself because you, you, you know you need a philosopher king to guide you. But the purpose is not to sacrifice your life for the collective or for God. The purpose is still to live for your life. Mm. So, so we went through a, a, a dramatic cultural shift with the rise of Christianity, and it's gonna take a long time to recover from the damage done by the monotheistic religions, primarily Christianity and Islam. Yeah. Um, Judaism just has never attained enough political power to have a big impact, or philosophical power. So it, it's gonna take a long time, and it's, you know, I'm not arguing that we couldn't do a better marketing job, but the point, but that's not going to solve the problem. So maybe if I was better at marketing, I'd go from 16,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers. But the better marketing is not going to change the world. What needs to change the world is for people to actually be, listen, listen, and, and, and engage. And, and, engage. Yeah, yeah. and then, well, of course, egoism makes sense. I mean, what else is there? Okay. Why should I live for you? So this is uh, anybody other than me. I mean, does anybody really love their neighbor more than themselves or like themselves? Right? What does the Old Testament, the New Testament tells you? Love your neighbor like yourself. I don't love my neighbor like myself. I, I don't really think I love my neighbor. Right? <laughs> I like some of my neighbors. I might I respect their property rights, but I don't love my neighbors. I mean, it it demeans the value of love. <clears throat> but I love myself. I love my wife. I love my kids. I don't love my neighbors. He's a heartless just, man. Just stop loving your neighbors. <laughs> but you don't. See, see, I'm the only one who actually says it. Everybody thinks they, 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 think they should love yeah. their neighbors. Yeah. And what does that do? See, this is, a, this is the trick that Christianity and socialists understand. Guilt is unbelievably powerful. Your yes. mother probably understands yeah. this. Jewish mothers certainly understand this. Right? Right? If you guilt people, you, Strong. You, you can really use them. So if you make everybody believe that they should love their neighbors, but they don't, oh boy. and they feel Shame guilty, them. Then, Shame them. exactly, yeah, and yeah. then you come to them and say, look, you should really love your neighbors, you should really help them out, we know you don't, but you know what, if I raise your taxes a little bit, we'll take your money and we'll help them we'll for do you. With it, yeah. And you go, oh good, that way I get reduce my guilt and I get to not love my neighbors all at the same time.
Fantastic. And that's what the state does. The state basically uses guilt in order to expand its power. Guilt alleviating mechanism. Yes, I mean the rich vote for higher taxes all the time. I was gonna I was, on themselves. I was gonna ask because I'm not sure about time. Very quickly, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, they are for higher taxes because they all feel guilty, and and this is the altruism. This is they 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 know they should take care of their fellow man. As much philanthropy as they do, they don't think it's enough, and they don't want to do more philanthropy for a variety of reasons. So, so it's easy for them to say the state should curse me into more philanthropy. That's what taxes is, and then I'll feel a it's little less. Subcontracting the morality, saying you guys deal with it. It's what everybody does. Gotcha. That's what the church has taught us. That's the whole the whole idea of, of sin and Catholicism. So you don't help him. Just to. okay. Last question. Yeah. Last question. We're too, we, I mean, this is the flaw in human beings, according to Christianity and according to conventional morality. Mm. We're all too selfish. And that's the fundamental flaw. That's really the original sin. You know, uh, Eve wanted knowledge. How dare she want knowledge? Because remember, she, she didn't eat from some random apple. The, the apple she ate from was the tree of knowledge. That's what God didn't want her to eat. He didn't want her to have knowledge, right? He wants you to be ignorant. He yes. wants you to be stupid. So she takes a bite from the tree of knowledge. That is the sin. Now, what is that? So, so basically and and that's that self-interested knowledge is self-interested so basically the original sin is you're self-interested and now you have to spend your life in service of others in or, service of others to idea. overcome that yeah, and yeah. since you can't overcome it since you're going to be selfish anyway then we have to penalize you by taxing you by regulating you by controlling you by by doing all these things to you in order to compensate for that original sin which is how dare you think of yourself amazing last question Please do ask Yaron about comparison between secular humanism and objectivism and why he believes objectivism is the best option for ex-Muslims. Also please ask Yaron if there are any upcoming efforts to translate objectivist literature into languages spoken in Muslim majority countries like Urdu or Arabic. I believe that a lot of ex-Muslims will find their lives enriched by objectivism. That's by Cher Rose. Yeah. So, um What's the first one? Uh, so, secular humanism. Se secular humanism versus so, objectivism. So secular humanism was a sudden development in uh, the field of ideas um, as the world transitioned away from um, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and from, from mm. the dominance of Christianity and, and Christian dogma. Yeah. So uh, secular humanism comes around in the Renaissance as they're discovering Greek ideas, secular ideas, pagan ideas, but really rediscovering philosophy. And they're trying to integrate it, and they're trying to they're trying to figure out what makes sense. But they they don't have a solution to the moral question, to what is goodness, what is ethics, what right. is right, what is just. <clears throat> so they basically what they do, and this is what I accuse Marx of doing, but really everybody does it. They secularize Christianity. They take the basic premise of Christian morality, the basic commandments, the basic ideas of Christianity, and they turn it into something secular. And so they can only go so far, in my view, with that. Because that's a dead end. Because the, 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 and, and the way to crush that is to say somebody says you should lift other people is to ask them why. And there's no answer, particularly if you don't believe in God. Because the Christian answer is because God said so. Right? By the way, if God says you should kill your oldest child, you should do that. Mm. You know, the only character who is a holy figure for all three religions is Abraham. Abraham. And why? Because of his Felt blind that. obedience. Amazing. His blind obedience. He says to God, you know, God comes to me and says, kill your son, I go to, go to hell, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I at least argue with him, yeah, yeah. Right? I know he's all powerful, so he'll, uh, he'll do what he wants, but at least argue with Take him, a stand, like yeah. Job does. Yeah. But no, Abraham says, yes, sir, and he goes, and it, you know, God stops him in the last minute, because, you know. And then we get the sacrificial lamb, which is the whole, yeah. right, right, right. So it's all about sacrifice. It's all about self-sacrifice, sacrificing your most important value for, so religion is authoritarianism. So you take that and you try to secularize it, and then people say, why? Why should I do that? And there's no answer. It's funny because a lot, no of, a lot of religious uh, people say that oh, atheists, this hedonists, they only care about pleasure and some, pursue that. Some atheists are. But, but this is the difference between general atheism and objectivism. Objectivism has an objectively proven, objectively derived from reality code of morality that if you don't live by, God won't strike you down, but reality will. And You'll get what you deserve. And with the second part of And the hedonists yeah. don't have fun. Right. They have fun in the short run, and they suffer in the long run. You know, if there was a line of cocaine here, yeah, I'd get a high, but I'd long? suffer long-term. Long? Yeah, exactly. I'd suffer long-term. Yeah, yeah. So, 
so the, the, the objectivism is a morality to have fun, to have a good life, to have a, to ultimately to achieve happiness over the long run, and it's a set of principles that leads to that. So, um, so yeah, atheists need a source of morality, and, and since they've rejected God as a source of morality, which was never really there because there is no God, the only other source of morality has to be reality. So you have to figure out from reality, from human experience, from knowledge of history, from knowledge of human psychology, what are the things that will lead to a good life? Okay. And so that's, so, so, uh, so I believe in a sense that Ayn Rand is the culmination of secular humanism. In that sense, Ayn Rand is the ultimate secular humanist. She's all about the human being. She's secular. And she is the first thinker uh, in a long line starting in the Renaissance to actually solve all the philosophical problems that, that existed. I'm not saying everything she said is true or everything she said will be true forever. I don't know of any flaw, if, if, th things that are wrong in it, but they might be. Um, the point is that she is in a line of thinkers that start with in the Greeks, go to the Renaissance, continue through the Enlightenment, then there's an anti-Enlightenment, and then she is the resurrection of that enlightenment. In that sense, she is the culmination of the enlightenment, a culmination of, of, the, of the secular humanist. It, it means nothing to me to be a secular humanist today if, you've got, if you have Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is so much better, so much fuller, so much more complete, so much more interesting, so much more logical and rational that it's a cop-out to be a secular humanist and not be an objectivist. Very interesting. And the last part of that question was, are you translating any of your works into Urdu, Arabic, Farsi? So for the for, for the Muslim so we people? don't uh, we don't translate any of Ayn Rand's works. People in particular countries do the translations of the works, and then they get them published in those works. Uh, so we would definitely support anybody who's interested in in um, in translating Ayn Rand into Farsi yeah. or Arabic. Some of Ayn Rand's essays are translated into Arabic, but they were translated in Israel into Arabic, wow. right? Um, it's in, in, and I, I do think that people, I, I know I have followers in Saudi Arabia, and I know I have followers in Kuwait and in the United Arab Emirates and all of them at least in Arab countries. And, and, but, it, but imagine if one of them wanted to translate Ayn Rand into Arabic That's true. and get it published there. Now, maybe in a country like Tunisia that seems to be heading in the right direction, is becoming more secular, and is, is, is maybe they could do it there. Maybe there was a time where we thought maybe we could do it in, in Egypt. Maybe in India, because uh, I mean, India, India is technically speaking. But India, you wouldn't translate to Arabic. Oh, yes, English, English, English. And in most yeah. Indian languages, uh, most in Indian languages, Atlas Shrugged is already translated. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, so yeah. Farsi and Arabic are the two languages that it's not. And, and I hope somebody does it. I, mm. I think it'll be a project. Somebody will do it. I think it's just a matter of time. And I will definitely support it. And I think it's a good idea. Um, most translations are pretty bad. Mm. So it, it can't replace. But it's learning English and but it's but it's better. It's yeah. it's part of that marketing effort. Very last thought. I know I've been, this is many last questions. Very last thought. Sorry, I've taken so much of your time. I've really enjoyed it. Sure. Last question. When you look at the Middle East and you look at the Muslim world, where do you see the future? Next fifty years, hundred years, is it going to get a lot worse or a lot better, or is it more the same? I think it's really hard to judge. I, I think generally it's going to be more of the same. Potentially getting worse. I think there might be some specific spots where it gets better. You know, I hear good things about Tunisia, but who knows? Um, I, I really think that the long-term future of the Middle East is much more likely to be dominated by the Islamists, the radicals, than it is by the secularists. But you never know. People have free will. People are constantly discovering new ideas. You're seeing what's going on in Lebanon right now with people in the streets and, mm -hmm. and really taking their lives, risking their lives to stand up to, among others, Hezbollah. And in, in, in advocating for really more freedom. That's what the Lebanese want. They want less corruption and more freedom. They're not quite ready to challenge religious yeah, authority, yeah, but, they, yeah. but they're certainly moving in that direction. It's, it's they're better, I think, than the general Arab Spring. Arab Spring was a, was too, the problem with the Arab Spring was it wasn't a movement for anything. It was against, mm. against the existing regimes. But it wasn't a secular movement. Arab Spring in Egypt was dominated Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood. It was a hodgepodge of everything. Yeah, it was a hodgepodge of everything. Yeah, and of course, the most consistent elements are the ones who win. So the Arab Spring was won by the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah, and it's yeah. only the Egyptian military that got rid of them ultimately. So, I, I, you know, I, I find it difficult to be optimistic about any place in the world right now. Oh, boy. 
but that's just a reality. I mean, I look at the United States, it's moving towards statism and to authoritarianism. I look at Europe, it's a complete unmitigated disaster. I mean, the UK might be in better shape than most, generally. Yeah. I, think, I think that's true. We haven't spoken true. about Brexit, which is not a bad thing, because I'm sick and tired of yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sick and tired of yeah, Brexit, okay, too. Yeah. So, so I think the UK is generally in better mm. situation than most countries. I think you have a better educational system. You, 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 you know, the British know more than most countries. And you've got a certain element of civilization here that is better. Um, but, I, I'm, you know, China's moving in the wrong direction right now. For years, I was very optimistic about China. And over the last five years, I've shifted. And now it seems like... The Especially what they're more. doing to the Uyghur... Uh, I mean, co uh, well, to Hong Kong, million, but, but also, Hong Kong and the Uyghurs. But also what they're doing to the Muslims in, in, um, in, like in Western China. Yeah. But, but, but more than that, the fact that this president is an authoritarian yeah. in a way that his political power has increased, not decreased. The previous presidents were decreasing political power, he's increased it. Uh, you know, the whole social credit system, all these things. And, but you look at South Korea has gone left. Uh, Singapore is even flirting with more socialist policies. Amazing. Uh, the whole world is moving away from what I think is the pinnacle political achievement in human history, and that is the founding of America. The, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are two most important do political documents in human history. And it, the, the world, including America, moving away from those documents. I'm, I'm, I cannot be optimistic right now about any place in the world. And I think the Middle East is, is, is worse than most in terms of where it is today and probably where it's heading. But, um, and one of the problems is, and I'll end with this, is that the world needs a beacon. It needs hope. It needs somebody to emulate and somebody to strive to be. And America was always that. And, and, and Barack Obama and Donald Trump have done more than any other two presidents in American history to do away with that. Both, both of them don't believe in American exceptionalism. Both of them believe that America is just another country that nobody should emulate us. We, we kill people. I thought Donald well. Trump would be that kind of When guy. Donald Trump was asked about Putin's killing of journalists, Donald Trump says, yeah, we kill people too. What's the big deal? I mean, literally said that. You can find it on YouTube. Um, Donald Trump's not an American exceptionalism. Donald Trump's an American first because they happen to be these borders and he happens to be an American. So America is more important, but he doesn't know what America is. He has no concept of the meaning of America in terms of the ideas behind it. So what the world needs is... I, is, is somebody to emulate. What the Middle East needs is to look up to something to strive towards. And as America is in decline, I think that goes away. And it's sad. You're seeing already people wanting to emulate China. Yes. And that is very scary and very, very dangerous. Bad. Very dangerous. So, so, you know, to try to end on a positive. Please. <laughs> I mean, the positive is that for the, for the first time, certainly since ancient Greece, we have available to us, and really available to all of us, a pro-life, pro- human flourishing, pro-individual happiness philosophy. We have a set of ideas that can free us from history, can free us from the constraint placed on us by religion. That, you know, that all the new atheists were all Christian in their morality. They, they challenged their epistemology and their metaphysics and they refused to challenge their morality. Here's a woman who comes about and yeah, yeah, the atheism stuff is easy. It's the morality stuff that's hard. And, and we have now a philosophical system that turns the world upside down, that really, that, that kind of completes the, what the Founding Fathers of America did. It provides a philosophical foundation for freedom, provides a philosophical foundation for capitalism, philosophical foundations for liberty. Mm. I mean, the world will be a much better place. The world will be an amazing place if more people embrace this philosophy. So go be dying man. And it'll change your life, and, it'll, it, you know, and, and, and you'll discover I think you'll discover a whole new world and a whole new potential for human beings that I think has been suppressed constantly by the status, by the Marxists, by the conservatives, by everybody. There is a possibility of human flourishing that is unimaginable to us if we embrace the right ideas. Yaron Brook, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed Good. it. Please Good. subscribe to your channel. Good awesome. interview. I enjoyed it. I uh, yeah, you're on Brook Show. You're on Brook Show on, on, on YouTube, YouTube or on, Facebook, Twitter, or in, uh, on podcast app. Podcast. of your choice absolutely it's been an absolute pleasure and are you, are you touring elsewhere as well or do you want to give some? i'm doing seven countries in seven days starting wow. tomorrow that's so, amazing uh, so, you so lots of talks in the next uh, in the next week fantastic it's been a pleasure once again yes, absolutely and i'll hope this to see fun. you soon guys thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this and if you like this please subscribe and like i'll see you guys next time thank you cool